Good evening. Well, I'd like to start by taking us all back to the night. You might be familiar with what the events that occurred on the night of August 5th on the East Coast or early morning hours of August 6th here uh, on the East Coast, excuse me. Um, when we took the Mars Science Laboratory through the atmosphere and into its seven minutes of terror. So I'd like to start by taking us all back to that night. Things are looking good. Coming up on entry. Vehicle reports entry interface. At this time, it'll begin pressurizing the propulsion system to increase the thrust of the system. Uh, we'll use that for all the maneuvering in the atmosphere we're about to do. We are standing by for guided start, the start of guided entry. We are beginning to feel the atmosphere as we go in here. The vehicle is just reported via tones that it has started guided entry. At this time, the vehicle is beginning to steer its way to the target. We have seen peak deceleration. That is starting its first tank reversal. Uh, it is reporting that we are seeing G's on the order of uh, 11 to 12 Earth T's. Tank reversal 2 is starting. We are now getting telemetry from Odyssey. We should have parachute deploy around Mach 1.7. Parachute is deployed. We are decelerating. Feet shield step has separated. We've found the ground. We're down to 90 meters per second at an altitude of 6.5 kilometers per second. Standing by for batch shell separation. We are in powered flight. We're at an altitude of one kilometer descending. Standing by for sky crane. Sky crane is started. Single to us, you remain strong. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. That happened about three months ago, and I still get emotional watching it. it just coming, bring me my, back to that night. So I apologize if I shed a man tear to quote an earlier speaker. <laughs> uh, you know, the funny thing about that night, as if we didn't have enough stress to worry about, about 20 minutes before landing, several of us heard over the communications network that our test bed, which is an exact replica of what we have on Mars, um, and we were running it ahead of landing, putting it through all the paces so that the computers on board our test bed would be in the right configuration when we landed, assuming we landed safely, in case we had any problems, needed to update software, we had our testbed ready to go. Several of us heard over the network that uh, the testbed crashed. So with 20 minutes to go, there was absolutely nothing we could do. Um, we just had to live with that and wonder whether that was a telltale of things to come or was just an anomaly in the testbed. Obviously, it was just an anomaly in the testbed, but we really didn't need anything else to stress us out. So. You know, since that night, people have asked me typically two common questions. The first one is, were you nervous? And of course the answer is yes, of course. You know, and it's almost always followed up by, well, what were you nervous about? What, what made you most nervous? Was it the fact that the events that night were watched by five million people, even though they occurred at 1.30 a.m. Eastern time? Most of us were totally unaware of that. Um, so it was scary, but no. Um, was it the fact that they made us all wear these matching blue shirts? Um, <clears throat> most engineers are not fashion conscious, and so it's not a big deal. And even those of us that think we are, um, it's a little bit scary. But no, obviously that's not what stressed me out personally. And it wasn't that supersonic parachute that inflates with a force of nearly 70,000 pounds, even though it only weighs 100 pounds. And it wasn't that crazy Rube Goldberg sky crane maneuver where we Roll, you know, lower the rover by these three nylon ropes and land it softly on the surface. It wasn't any of those things. To quote a colleague of mine, when asked a similar question, 
there isn't one minute in particular of those seven minutes of terror that I worry more about than the others. Like any good parent, I love all seven minutes of terror equally. <laughs> so, as I go through this talk, I hope to convey to you how we as a team came to love all seven minutes of terror equally and got comfortable with the events that happened that night. This is a portrait of the 40 missions that humankind has sent to the planet Mars, along with the flags of the countries that have sent them there. In the 12 o'clock position there at the top is the Mars Science Laboratory, with the Curiosity rover in it. It represents the 40th attempt at Mars. Throughout our efforts to get to Mars, there have been failure after spectacular failure, which has given Mars the reputation as the Bermuda Triangle of the solar system. <laughs> Uh, and rightfully so. The first two missions, which were sent by the Soviet Union, and you can see I, I expanded, there's a lot of data there that you probably won't be able to see, but they were both destroyed during launch. A few other examples of failures that have occurred. The payload fairing failed to open. That's the nose cone of the rocket, not letting the spacecraft separate and go on its mission. Missed the planet. <laughs> that one hurts. <laughs> it's over there. Crashed on the surface. Well, I mean, that's an all too common problem and that certainly was our concern going in. We wanted to make sure that when we landed, our velocity was gonna be zero one way or another, but it was just the speed right before it was zero. <laughs> so this one particularly hurts. Crashed due to a units mix up between Imperial and metric. You may remember that one. So this is what goes through our mind <laughs> as we prepare for a mission like this. Going into landing that night of the 39 missions that preceded Mars Science Laboratory, the score, so to speak, was 15 to 24. Humankind was losing. Less than 40% success rate, 38 to be specific. And so, what makes us willing to wade into these waters of this Bermuda Triangle? What makes us courageous and, and want to take on a challenge like that? Well, ingrained at the culture, in the culture at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory is this quote, which we heard from Alec Ross also yesterday, speaking of the gray twilight, um, that really gives us charge to dare mighty things. It shows up in signs. This sign is from Mission Control, where we operate the Curiosity rover. It shows up in presentations, and it shows up on jars of our good luck peanuts that you guys may be aware of that we bring out during critical events like launches or landings or giving TEDx talks. <laughs> so... Um, but it does give us charge to dare mighty things, even though failure is omnipresent in the endeavor. And it's really ingrained in our culture. Um, and it speaks of glorious triumphs. These are really telling us, make your goals matter. Set the bar high. Do something that if you succeed, even though chances are you won't initially, set the bar high. And do so because it is better to fail than to rank with those that know neither victory nor defeat. So with this culture, we're able to tackle challenges like taking a car, as was discussed, and landing it on Mars in the name of science. Curiosity rover represents a significant next step in Mars exploration. This picture is the, the three rovers that uh, we have sent to the red planet. In the foreground there from the Pathfinder mission is the Sojourner rover. And in the mid-1990s, it's about the size of a microwave oven, as you can see, mid-1990s, we landed it and proved that we could drive around a little bit. We, could, we were mobile on Mars, not just landers. That was followed in the upper left by Spirit and Opportunity, where we showed we could actually explore. We could go further distances over more varied terrain. And over there on the right, next to that five foot, 10 inch person that's there for scale, is the Curiosity rover. So it's a 2,000 pound robotic machine that's part geologist, part chemist, part meteorologist, part nature photographer, and part explorer. And as my wife would say, all it needs is an Indiana Jones hat and it'd be all set. <clears throat> so our mission was to send this scientist, this scientist explorer, to a part of Mars that the international science community felt was important and a, and a good place to do science. Previous missions were sent to parts of Mars that were safe, right? Safe to land on, low, close to the equator, so how do you do this? You do it by testing. This is an example from our supersonic parachute tests. And early on, you can see total structural failure. We had many of these. Over the course of this project, it was a 10-year project, we had 4,500 individual failures, many of them of this magnitude. 
and many of them occurring in the last four years as the hardware and software was coming together. But one by one, they were solved. We'd peel back the onion and, and fix them, even though we'd have a problem hiding right behind it. After that first structural failure, there were several other failures with different causes that we had to get through before we finally had a successful inflation of the parachute in the test. And then, of course, we did on Mars as well. And we were able to solve these problems by not just fixing them, not just patching whatever was broken, but really understanding root cause. Really understanding the physical underpinnings, the, the primary physics that governed what the problem was and how the hardware and software and the environment would all interact to either make that problem happen or make it go away. Another way we would come to love each of the seven minutes of terror was when we couldn't solve the problems and we were left with unknowns and uncertainties. We would seek those uncertainties out and then quantify them, get comfortable with them. This is a picture from computer animation of when we ended the sky crane maneuver, when the rover touched down on Mars. We had no way of knowing what the terrain would be like under the rover at the exact precise location of touchdown how many rocks there would be, what the size of the rocks would be, what the slope of the ground would be, exactly the speed that we'd be coming in at. But we could provide a quantitative range for each of those based on observations from orbit, et cetera, and understand at least the range, the full spectra of those rocks and those, that terrain and all that. And then we would put that in what we call a Monte Carlo analysis where you, you do a simulation and you vary those parameters and you do that thousands of times. And you look to make sure that throughout that, that the rover structure can handle the landing under all those conditions. Then, of course, you test some of that. You test to make sure that, you test some of the combinations to make sure that the physics are being properly represented in your simulation. It's another way that you come to love each of the seven minutes of terror equally. Okay, so we've landed. Now what? Well, the journey's really only beginning. This is one of the first images that came down from Curiosity, and it shows the final science target, Mount Sharp. It's a three mile high mountain in the center of Gale Crater and it rivals the Grand Canyon with its layers of sediment and its opportunity for us to explore the history of Mars to a time that we think Mars was a much wetter place and maybe see that point where it went from wet to dry. This is also Mount Sharp using one of our color imagers. This is the western flanks in the direction that Curiosity will be traveling. It's gonna be a long journey, it's gonna take several months, especially as I've talked to many of you outside, we have a team of 400 scientists, and they're essentially all in the back seat of the car on this road trip, and they're wanting to stop and look at every shiny object or every rock <laughs> along the way, right? So, we, we have to balance that, and, and we will. Th this image, with its diverse colors and its interesting terrain, it, it represents potential. When this image first came down and we put it up on the screens in the control room at Mission Control, several of the scientists in the room were overcome by emotion and started breaking down in tears because of the potential that this picture represents, the potential for scientific discovery, the potential to look into Martian past. As an engineer, this picture represents the potential for more challenges requiring us to continue to dare mighty things. One of those challenges there in the foreground, that dark material, are sand dunes. Several hundred kilometers of sand dunes that Curiosity will have to cross before even starting the climbing. And then of course there's the climbing. That magnified boulder there is the size of the Curiosity rover. So you can imagine when Curiosity gets there, what the canyons and the surrounding buttes would be like and the challenges that we're likely going to have to tackle, not to mention the problems that may have arisen on the trip there, requiring us to continue to dare mighty things. And whatever new minutes of terror come up, it'll require us to get comfortable with them using the same techniques. So I'd like to end this talk with a self-portrait that Curiosity took using a camera out at the end of its robotic arm. <laughs> kind of looks like Wally. -E, I know, I, I love that movie. Um, with the stereo eyes and everything. And w along with the Wally theme, I'll also end with a, a quote similar to Theodore Roosevelt's quote that Walt Disney um, used with his company, at, talking about his company not looking backwards for very long. You do need to look backwards. You need to learn where you've been, right? You need to try to fail forward, um, as we've been learning on these two days. Keep moving forward, opening up new doors, and doing new things, right? Doing it because we have curiosity. And keep going down new paths. And going down those new paths, right, it requires us to get comfortable with each of those seven minutes of terror in whatever endeavor we do. And we do that by assembling a team of intelligent, 
creative and hardworking people, by letting no question go unanswered, solving the problems. We do it by getting comfortable with uncertainty, quantifying it, and understanding the risks and rewards. And then by having a culture throughout all levels of management that allows you to dare mighty things. You'll still have fear and worry, of course, but intellectually you can be calm when the event occurs. And then you wait for those important words, as we did on landing night. Touchdown confirmed, we're safe on Mars. <laughs>